Hallo und willkommen to Zeitgeist, your place for German history, politics and culture. My name is Katja Heuer and I'm a German-British historian and journalist. I host this podcast, which goes very nicely with my Zeitgeist blog, which you can find and subscribe to at katjaheuer.uk. I say this is the place for German history and politics, but today I'm stretching the remit of this concept just a little bit. Trust me, it'll be worth it. Um, because today I have with me the awe-inspiring biochemist Dr. Kathleen Carrico. In 2023, she was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine together with her colleague Drew Weissman for the discoveries that enabled the modified mRNA technology used in the uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccinations. So if you now think that's great, but what's biochemistry got to do with German history? Just wait until you hear Kathy's backstory. Um, I was sent her brilliant autobiography, Breaking Through My Life in Science, um, to read ahead of the paperback launch later on. And I found that there's about a million parallels to the story which I've been talking a lot about recently, namely that of East Germany. This is because Katalin Kariko grew up in socialist Hungary as the daughter of a butcher and told stories in her book that cover the whole range of experiences which East Germans also frequently tell me about. So this is things like strong commun communities, excellent education, but also the brutal oppression, for example, in the wake of the Hungarian uprising and state surveillance through secret police. So as our publisher put it, from butcher's daughter in communist Hungary to winner of the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2023, this is the story of one woman's extraordinary determination. Welcome, Katalin Kariko. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Katja, for inviting me. <laughs> Thanks for making the time. So, so maybe let's start at the beginning then. You were born in 1955 in socialist Hungary one year before the Hungarian uprising. Can you tell us a little bit about your childhood? Oh, I, I grew up in a very simple household. Uh, we had an adobe house and uh, with reed roof and uh, we didn't have the refrigerator, television or running water. But, you know, I, I didn't know that we don't have it because none of our neighbor had it. <laughs> we had a uh, dirt road and then the kids were playing on the street but there were no cars, maybe once a week, and then all of the kids would <laughs> run outside. And and we had um, animals like pigs and chickens and uh, cats, and and we had big vegetables garden. And, uh, you know, that's what everybody went to their uh, garden to figure out what to cook today. And, uh, you know, it was a different lifestyle. And, uh, you know, when we need milk, you know, we went to the neighbor. We didn't have a cow, but the neighbor did. And that's that was it. You know, it's very simple, very happy life. And we had enough to eat because some people did not. But uh, so that's what, uh, you know, we had a very good family. I had I have a sister three years older and um, so I learned from her also a lot and from my parents. It was a very simple life, but we live and very happy. And, and you kind of make a, a really strong point in your book about expressing your gratitude for that simple life that you just described for the way that you grew up. I mean, not many people imagine a childhood in 1950s and 60s Hungary to be idyllic. And you yourself describe a kind of you know, like you just said, like a hand to mouth kind of experience um, where you had to work quite hard alongside your, your school to help your family. So what was so valuable about an experience that not many people imagine to be a comfortable one? Uh, you know, what I just mentioned, the neighbor had a cow and I remember seeing a cow uh, giving birth. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that the excitement there. And and uh, my mother also planted chicken. That's what meant, you know, that you we collected the eggs and she put the hen on it. And then I could see how a chicken is coming out from the egg. And this wonder that, oh, yesterday I just eat an egg. And there were no chicken with it. Now it is a chicken. How how it is all happens? And we had the, these storks coming, you know, and leaving in the fall. And then how how did they could find their way back. And it was all of this uh, magic. And of course, today, maybe the kids said, oh, probably had a GPS and what something, but we had nothing to go on. And it was just a wonderful life. And uh, I, very I was direct, very- very isn't it? Very analog. 
very, very active, you know, that I was, you know, climbing up the tree constantly. I was sitting up in the tree. We had a big tree there and then checking out, you know, the nest, uh, the eggs are there. Now the little birds is there and now they are gone and that's the life. And and it was just um, uh, how we lived our life, you know. <laughs> and, and yet sort of politics did find its way into that life as well though didn't it so you describe how your father inadvertently ended up at the sharp end of the regime's attention what what happened to him and what did this mean for you and your family so he he was uh, you know not a political activist he was just an honest person and you know that ended up that he got a suspended uh, prison terms uh, and that meant that you know he couldn't uh, get a job so he was uh, doing uh, uh, just uh, daily jobs and, you know, going uh, construction, working. He was a butcher, but he worked on construction. And But uh, I, I did not uh, notice as, as a depressive uh, environment. He was always, you know, doing whatever he could do. And he was whistling, singing and... And, you know, I just later realized that uh, why he's not working in the butcher shop that, you know, he couldn't do other things. But then he went to work in a, finally in a pub and uh, we were there with my sister. We helped, you know, I had to, you know, change the wine arrived in a barrel and then we put in uh, bottles and we, you know, we learn all of these things that if you don't do that, you know, the wine get acidic and so many many things you know you are doing and learning <laughs> that um uh, otherwise you wouldn't know so anyway so I, I i know that he couldn't be butchered for up until i was in high, high school but uh, you know he did not complain you know he mm. just you know that's life and then he tried to get the best out of it sometimes he went you know like uh, cutting the wool from the sheep in the spring with another man from the city and uh, a small town where we lived and they went and a couple of weeks later they came back and uh, and then he earned some money and there was some seasonal thing in the winter he went to different houses and they asked him to you know process the pig you know for make sausage and other things and uh, so that's uh, what our life and uh, so I know that it was not uh, he wanted to be a butcher, but he didn't talk about, you know, mm -hmm. he did the, the work and then he was a very cheerful person. And, and his status sort of both helped and hindered you in lots of ways, didn't it? So in some ways, because he was a working class man, uh, you had you had the letter F, was it for physical um, next to your next to your name, which kind of. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what that meant, but at the same time, the regime didn't forget that he was once on the on the bad list either. So, in what ways did, did your father's status basically affect your own upbringing and education? Since my parents were not uh, highly educated, my father had six elementary, my mother had eight elementary education. So the common system had that that uh, the children who might be bright and smart, you know, had to be helped. And uh, because they might not thinking about, you know, higher education because they, you know, I might be end up to be a butcher and or a bookkeeper, you know, because that's what my parents were doing. And and so the um, in school, like in high school, for example, when uh, my teacher said that, oh, you can be a scientist and he was talking about and I believed and then you know when I was 16 according to the books which is in the <laughs> high school there I announced that I will be a scientist and two biology teacher was assigned to pay attention so if there is a competition you know they should tell me and to uh, go there or something like that and and uh, so that was it and also for uh, universities when students at the university uh, advertise that uh, they can uh, help uh, under privileged children to you know prepare for their university exam you know they notified me and I went there so it was not that uh, if you have a, a 
first, uh, if you have a, a parents who are not educated and you can get into the university, even lower score, you have to have the high score but they gave you opportunity that in the middle of the summer for two weeks I could get up five o'clock in the morning at the university and the students and the teachers were giving lectures and you know I could enter a big building a university I could see in my first time in my life a professor which I haven't seen before and it wouldn't be the time when I go for written and an oral exam that I would be frightened to see a professor. So it was like more uh, helping, uh, giving you opportunity to catch up. That was mostly because, you know, later again, you know, I, in this small town, I couldn't learn English. So I was 18 years old and getting to the university, my classmates could speak English and, you know, I, I could learn Russian and, and other things, and, and and again, you know, others attended like chemistry class. They have, they knew how to work with the pipettes, the burettes. I didn't even know how to set those things up. So, you know, I um, so a system assisted the students who whose parents were not uh, highly educated and could go. And, and even the winter vacation time, you know, I went uh, back again and they gave us, you know, housing, I mean, and uh, we could go there for a week and study and learn. So, so you was... you were sort of teachers and then later at university as well, people really supported a, an early drive that you had for science. I mean, you spoke earlier about how you watched sort of, I don't know, the birth of a cow and those sorts <laughs> of things around you, which probably sparked an early interest, but maybe it's not um, easy for a working class child basically to recognize these things as a natural talent. Maybe did your father had this this word that he called you, what was it again, searcher? Um, yeah. in, <laughs> that, that was the one, yeah. So did, yeah. Um, did people in Hungary in the 1960s and 70s still consider it odd for, for a girl or a young woman to be sort of a, a science nerd? In that I way don't, i don't think uh, i i you know i don't i don't i don't remember that i felt that because i am a girl i should be do something i think it, it was this communism it was like oh you can be anything kind of they say to us and uh, you know there were a system there you know then they can <laughs> hit your head or they can help you or something but uh, i i don't think I, I was surprised. I have to say that uh, Rutgers University, I get the honorary doctorate. And then I heard that uh, 1973, when I went to the university, that was the first time women could go there. You know, mm. I, I thought that in America, every university could go girls. And, no, you know, we were more advanced actually there because, uh, you know, not just um, I was not the first generation uh, who could, uh, you know, women could enter to the university. There were already uh, women at the university earlier than 73. Mm, and it seemed almost an, an obvious thing. I hear that from East Germans a lot as well, where people say that this wasn't a feminist thing to do. It was just a, a thing that, you know, was, was kind of normal at that point. In general, you talk um, quite a bit about kind of how women were had, had lifestyles in Hungary that were almost um, kind of freer in the sense that they could do more things. So you talk, for instance, very um, positively about childcare and the childcare system, which really helped you and was essential when your, when your daughter, Susan, was born. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that worked and how it supported you in becoming a scientist? Uh, so um, in, in Hungary and maybe in other countries around in the Eastern Bloc uh, had that, uh, that um, you could uh, leave your child is uh, paying a nominal fee and the child care system, you know, when you went to work. And then it was like even registered nurse were this uh, daycare, which was, you know, from three months old, they already take a uh, young child. And uh, they were open very early, like five o'clock. So if you have work in the three shifts and you have to go six, then you can leave your child there. And uh, they were late and then in... Uh, open late and then even in the city there were certain uh, child care was open even the weekend so if you had to place the child somewhere you know you could live there and what was interesting is that registered nurses were there and every day a pediatrician came 
uh, who you could leave a message to check out because something is, you know, first time mom, I don't know, and my mom lived in different uh, uh, part of the country. So whether it is normal or not normal, and then, you know, she would uh, check it out, what is your concern, and would re leave a message that you have to go a specialist or that's normal, you know, you don't have to worry. And, uh, and we had to, it was high quality childcare and the nominal fee. So it was, uh, you know, supported, uh, subsidized by the system and, uh, and they gave the clothes and everything. So when I, my daughter was in the, this uh, childcare system, it was, uh, I spent more time with her because, uh, you know, uh, when it was, I was at home, I had to wash the, uh, diapers and other things because in in uh, in uh, she was growing up that she we didn't have the disposable things that's actually when we came to the u.s learn you know she was the only one in the class that we did not have <laughs> disposable diapers and you toilet train that they this uh daycare also helped a lot so they you know they um helping them toilet training so so it was uh, it was uh, easy, <laughs> and uh, when I came to the United States and I I said about these things, they said, "Why did you leave? Oh my God, <laughs> that is a paradise." <laughs> <laughs> when I uh, sometimes talk about this in in Germany and to Germans, because obviously there was a similar system in the GDR, I often get quite fierce criticism from historians who say that well, there were lots of negative effects. There's yeah. indoctrination, the militarization of society a double burden on women who have to be mothers and work. Um, do you see any of these criticisms? Do you sometimes get that? On, and what do you think about them? I I, I don't think, uh, I don't remember. So it, as, as a scientist, you know, I want to go back to, to the work. And uh, I just uh, uh, realized here that the, the child care and many other countries now I traveled more, you know, it was, uh, is, you don't earn enough. To cover it, so many times, you know, the women just uh, if they don't have resources, uh, financial resources, they just have to give up their job, and whether in the beginning because taking care of the child, and and later always everybody looked at the woman to take care of the elderly parents, and and um, so it is uh, it is difficult. Not just okay, we are getting pregnant and we have to carry the child that's fine and it takes also you know time and more uh, uh, preparation for that but but after birth you know that uh, you have to suggest usually to the girls right to find the right husband you know who helps you because you know this uh, has to be two person is raising that child and mm -hmm. not alone and uh, so I mean, uh, the system was good, and every time when I have an opportunity, I always say, "Is government somebody's here from government?" Because that would help not just the scientists, but all of these uh, women to, you know, to be independent. And uh, yeah. yeah, and and going back a little bit to your time at university, that was another um, episode in the book that I found really quite fascinating because you talk about the rigors of it. It was a really high quality education, also quite intense, especially for you. Um, but also the fact that you had to do help with the harvest and other things like that alongside, which now seems sort of almost unimaginable. In what ways would you say was that experience for you to study in Hungary different compared to how people study in the US and elsewhere in the Western world today? Um. What I could see actually uh, for the higher education, what I've I wonder about why why it is so advanced here, you know, this university system and why how how they could spin out a company and all of the students. And I realized that in in Hungary uh, and in other countries in Europe, in Germany also, there are uh, universities and there are research institutes and the high co highest quality of research is going in the research institute because they don't have to spend time to educate and they give lectures. But in the US, uh, you know, the universities is where the highest quality of research is going and then they can get the students, spin out companies. So 
um, so I think that maybe that uh, should be done in Europe or so maybe that uh, it would help uh, also uh, educate uh, educator you know to uh, if would be the top research would be done and that's what uh, they could uh, give the lectures about because then you know you are learning from somebody who is in the forefront of the research and uh, for the researcher maybe it would be good and also in Europe they would teach and uh, easier for them to get students uh, get their ideas and then you know spin out companies uh, because in Europe, I, I was seeing this uh, statistic that 85% uh, of the patents uh, at the universities never developed to anything, you know, mm. because nobody will walk into the IP office and say, oh, that's a great idea, modified <laughs> RNA, oh, that's probably something. The person who is doing the research, that person recognized that what it would be useful for, and they have to give up their position and let's go out and try and maybe fail. But, you know, we keep doing things. So that's a, that's a kind of uh, attitude or, or yeah, that's uh, uh, what I wish, you know, maybe in Europe could be mm, more. That's a change. Um, and you also described that during that time when you were at university in Hungary, you had a somewhat sinister visit from the from the secret police what what happened there can you maybe describe what, what that was about um i finished the uh, uh, education and i started to work at the biological research center just started in the fall of uh, 1978 when um uh, somebody you know two two guys showed up and uh, and uh, I, I had a guest there, so I, otherwise I wouldn't open the door. But uh, and then they came in and you know talk about that um, I should um, help uh, uh, the system because uh, in this biological research center there are foreigners and they might stealing the data and and we have to keep an eye on it and so on and uh, and was telling me that you know I should uh, help them because uh, you know they can make my life. Uh, uh, difficult and how disappointed my father would be and then that was when I completely lost because when they described that they met my my father they yeah. went to the small town and I imagine immediately my father who is very friendly and maybe think that oh these are just stop by guys and uh, you know in the pub my father liked to go there and you know to not to drink but to talk there with other men and <laughs> And then I imagine and and they talk exactly what they said. I realized that these people met my father. And then they describe how disappointed he would be to learn that, you know, I not pursuing my career because they make it difficult. And and so this this was the situation that they they said that, you know, I have to have, but uh, I have to say, I work in a very small team. There were four of us there and very isolated part of this institute. And none of them, none of us were foreigners. <laughs> and uh, so I said, OK, what could I say? You know, mm. and that that was, um, yeah, that was it. And then they time to time called me up and, they, you know, what's going on and you know, but I had nothing, nothing to say because, you know, I, I, I didn't imagine, couldn't imagine that somebody I am doing these jealous and doing those things that somebody would be, oh, that would be a big secret or something, you know, and I didn't believe the whole thing that uh, uh, is uh, relevant, but. It reminded me a bit of a, of a story Angela Merkel once told how the Stasi turned up when she was a research scientist um, as well and kind of tried to persuade her to spy on her colleagues. And she just came up with an excuse and said she's so bad at lying, people would instantly know, um, you know, when she was trying to spy on them. And that's apparently how she got out of it or she oh. she told that story in that way. So it's it's interesting how, you know, despite the fact that life kind of carries on and people people do their things, you still can't quite escape the fact that you you live in a regime that that does that to you one way or another um and you soon moved to the us can i first of all 
ask were you just allowed to leave i didn't didn't quite get that in the in the book so did did they just let you go i mean uh, i uh, was no more funding uh, we received for the team and they said you know you are with july first you are g- gone no more salary and then i i applied a position in hungary first and uh, sent out letters nobody replied then I said, okay, maybe I have to go to Europe and I send letter to, you know, scientists who work on the same field to L- London, Montpellier and Madrid. And all re- responded that, oh, you are welcome. Come here and uh, just uh, bring your salary. Yeah. But we were not allowed to apply for uh, funding from the, because we were behind the Iron Curtain and then you know, some colleague at the, at the Biological Research Center said, you know, try in the U.S. And then I sent letter again that they responded. And uh, Professor Suhadonik said that I can come in July. Yeah, I, he has a position. And that's how I ended up in uh, America, where I never wanted to come. I never even want to leave Hungary. Yeah. <laughs> that that comes up very strongly in your in your book and I'll come back to that a little bit later but when you left so you just said basically there were really strict restrictions on things like funding how much money yeah. you were actually allowed to, to take from Hungary so you you came up with a little trick didn't you to take some of your savings along with you how how did you do that Yes, so uh, so in Hungary they let uh, somebody to go, and uh, my colleague researcher actually they went to the U.S. and they came back because otherwise there would be some punishment for the rest of the colleagues. So there were uh, they could uh, come and go, and uh, but uh, you know the limitation was there that uh, only fifty fifty dollar was allowed, and uh, so. Uh, um, that's how much money we could leave. And they said that I have a job offer, so ask them to send you money. But, you know, what university I never showed up would send me money in the U.S. And it's, you know, they don't understand. And, and even I couldn't even purchase the ticket from Philadelphia to, to, to New York to Philadelphia. They said uh, you have to find somebody who will send officially money to your bank account. And uh, so... That was also as a Swiss uh, guy who was my sister corresponding friend or some, you know. And actually, you know, I always invite him when I in Switzerland, I get an award. <laughs> I am inviting him and told him that if he would not send money, <laughs> we might be still walking from New York to Philadelphia <laughs> because we were not allowed. And and also that uh, this fifty dollar, you know, is enough in the U.S. for nothing, and and we have to survive here one uh, one month. So we sold our car. We had a lot of, and uh, my c- classmate purchased, and we on black market. Uh, because we had at the university students from um, Arab students, and then they had currency. And then on black market, you know, I exchanged the uh, was about a thousand dollar equivalent, but they didn't have dollars. It was uh, English pounds. So I didn't even know at that point that in America, I have to take a day off to go to a central bank to exchange it to dollar because it's not every corner you could uh, change. You know, they don't exchange money here. Anyway, so that um, money, you know, because it's un- in unofficially obtained, uh, I had to put inside Susan teddy bear i cut it up in the back and we put the money there in wrapped it up that maybe dog will not smell out i you don't know the what in the border they had there in in the airport and and saw it back and gave it to susan who was two and a half years old and she carried through the border <laughs> because that was the danger you know that uh, we are not supposed to take money out from con- hungary and that's how we get here. <laughs> Such a wonderful story. And when you um, arrived in the US, it must have been quite a shock to the system, I would imagine. Like when, when I hear kind of East Germans talk about when they go to West or went to West <laughs> Germany, all the colors, the sounds, the smells, the way that people do things. What, what were the biggest differences that immediately hit you? I, I mean, uh, 
so first that I thought that these Americans need air conditioning and we arrived, <laughs> arrived July 31st. It was so humid. We hardly could breathe and we realized oh, that's why they need the air conditioning. We thought that, you know, Americans are, you know, in Hungary, we didn't add air conditioning. <laughs> okay, we need here. And then, you know, the first day I went to work and they said, you know, that you have to uh, get a bank. I said, bank? I never had a bank. He said, how did you get your salary? Well, I said, it was an envelope, counted the last penny, you know, <laughs> last foreign in it. Oh, no, we you know, don't give money like that, <laughs> you know, and everything what uh, um, everything was so big and and uh, we couldn't believe uh, the life here, you know, it was everything very, very strange. And uh, and of course, you know, I have uh, my salary was 17,000 a year and, uh, you know, three of us were here and my mother came a couple of months later just to have with Susan and four four people, you know, uh, and we went to the store and we could not spend more than $30. And my mother did not like the bread. So, you know, when I grew up, my mother baked the bread. And in the United States, she started to bake the bread <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> you know, that this bread is you... The whole thing immediately just collapsed. And, I, I know, know exactly so, what you mean. It's the same when Germans go places, they always complain about the bread. Yeah, so everything was uh, different. And my my husband uh, get uh, odd jobs, uh, sometimes uh, fixing cars. He has, he has all of the story. He came home in the evening, you know, and he was telling me, oh, today is a Iranian uh, uh, guy who <clears throat> owned uh, some curtain factory i was fixing cars and he had all of these uh, stories to tell me and i mean i just went and do the research <laughs> and uh, so it was it was uh, quite a experience and cultural shock you have to understand that here in this country i have no relatives no classmate no teacher no no nobody you know, and, and you are so on your own with your little family and try to survive. And this, uh, you know, is uh, hard. And then there is no way back. We didn't even have tickets, return tickets. So we knew that, uh, OK, we have to work hard and whatever they say, we have to swallow our pride. And we just have to learn very quickly how to swim <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, it is uh, uh, this is. We have to survive here. <laughs> yeah, and you describe every time you had these sort of um, little setbacks and things that what you did is you just threw yourself into work, really, with a, with a single-minded determination that is quite admirable, but also clearly something that, that you've always had throughout your life. Um, but you did experience a number of, of setbacks, didn't you, as a research scientist? So at one point, your boss or your former boss seemed to uh, have threatened to have you deported if you change your job. Uh, and from your account, you seem to have dealt with this sort of with a strange kind of corners. It's almost a stubbornness that you had. So when your teachers or somebody, even the secret police or whoever threatened you with anything, you seem to just come back from that and say, fine, but I won't do it anyway. Um, were you not terrified? Which which of the two did you find more uh, intimidating? Was it kind of worse being told to be deported from the US or having people in Hungary tell you that they might tell your dad stories about you that might make him disappointed? It was uh, uh, constantly it was uh, focusing on what should I do? That's what I spend my time. Not that why, why me, what they are mean or something, or Professor Suadonik, who was very kind and he loved me. He always praised me. And all of a sudden, you know, I am a black, black sheep there. And it was you know, I couldn't uh, meditate on that immediately. What? OK, OK, what should I do? What next? And that's what I am telling, you know, in these days that uh, the who is listening is that don't try to feel sorry for yourself. You are the victim or something. Don't waste your time. Things happen, you know, shit. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. and, and, and you just focus. OK, what can I do? Okay, here in the U.S., uh, actually, he reported me to the authorities because I was uh, I had to go there with the lawyer and spend so much money on, you know, I, almost a year I worked just to pay the lawyer who represented me there, and um, you know, and then I never went to Johns Hopkins because he called them up. 
that uh, I am a fugitive. So, you know, uh, if I spent time uh, feeling sorry for myself, I wouldn't, okay, what can I do? Who, I don't have a recommendation letter, so I just have to focus who hated him. And then I call them up. I don't have a recommendation. Please help me out and find somebody who can hire me right away. And uh, so that's that's always that um, focus on on what next, what I can do, because I cannot change that. I, and uh, I know that the professor, he wanted me to work forever next to him because he liked that I worked so hard. And uh, so he didn't fire me because uh, I was bad there. It was just, you know, that happened at the pen because I didn't bring the money. But uh, here, you know, he wanted to frighten me, but he didn't know me that uh, it will push away more. Backfire, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think also what comes through really strongly throughout your book is that you were determined that this thing that you were working on was worth working on, no matter what people told you, it's not bringing in enough money, it's not not something that, you know, even when you publish stuff in research journals that people got particularly excited about. Can you try in really simple terms, explain to, to us why, or what it actually was that you were chasing? What were you trying to do with your research? Um, when I worked at the Betters, though, where, you know, I was chased away from here, <laughs> that, um, you know, I, I realized that uh, um, reading a lot, uh, that, uh, messenger RNA would be a best way to deliver rather than people at that point work uh, on Tyson's RNA. Everything was about on Tyson's. And I said, oh, it would be simpler, not that a little molecule had to find where is the RNA. Let's deliver the RNA and find uh, how some disease can be treated by that. And, and when I looked it up, I could see that, oh, it can be made the RNA, messenger RNA in a tube. Oh, that's easy. And um, so I was just uh, believed so strongly that that's the way uh, maybe therapy could be done. And uh, so this was uh, 1988, 89. And that's from on, I was uh, convinced that uh, people more likely need a messenger RNA, which uh, temporarily produce a protein, which is therapeutic, good for the patient. And because most of the disease are not genetic, we have aches and pains, and that would be ideal. But, um, you know, the gene therapy uh, uh, sequencing of the genome just started. They start to discover certain diseases caused by gene mutation. And then people thought that, oh, we can deliver the correct genes, and then it is a fix. And, uh, and people who... Uh, to whom I mentioned that I work with RNA, you know, they kind of felt so sorry for me because their experience was that, oh, <laughs> the RNA, oh my God, it is always that great. And uh, I try to tell them that because uh, isolating plasmid, which is the workhorse of uh, molecular biology lab, you know, you are using RNAs to remove the bacterial RNA and all of the laboratories completely contaminated with uh, this uh, enzyme, which can cut up and degrade these important molecules. And so when they try to run in a gel apparatus, is already contaminated, they always get, oh, smear, degradation. And I said, no, I, I work with it. It's not degrading. It's good. <laughs> but, uh, you know, people did not really believe. And then especially that I didn't get any funding. So I did all of the experiment with my own hands uh, in, uh, believe it or not, you know, in a one person lab, really, uh, thanks to always had one person at least who paid my salary, who was believing that, oh, that, that will be good, that RNA will be, mRNA will be good for something. At the beginning, we could um, see that maybe in cell, you know, like, um, uh, uh, Maybe in in a bone marrow transplantation, we can deliver uh, an RNA holding for the telomerase, so older people can give bone marrow, and and that would be useful. And so I always in my mind was there. Oh, what could be useful for? <laughs> and uh, so as uh, we progressed and the RNA performance was better, I could see you know maybe it would be. It was working in a mice 
in, in mouse and uh, and we did a lot of experiment and thinking a human is 3000 bigger than a little mouse and then we could you know maybe maybe it will be work in human just i have to find the right disease i always were working on messenger RNA coding for a therapeutic protein so which would be transiently overexpressing maybe in a wound and then it close quicker and maybe there will be no uh, scar i was doing experiment in that direction also so it was always a therapeutic protein i was not working uh, any vaccine or things like that but the big moment the big breakthrough did in the end come with the vaccine didn't it so i mean one day your research all of those years that you put into it did pay off when we had the uh, covid 19 pandemic obviously everyone listening will remember that i would imagine um and uh, the the thing that you eventually won the nobel prize for effectively was that your research enabled for the covid vaccines covid vaccines basically to to work and eventually save well countless of lives really um but you still you say in the book that you still sometimes get criticism from people like like vaccine skeptics and so on does that does that hurt you do you think that that's something that um you know gets to you or do you feel that you just patiently explain to people why you've done the right thing why this is the right thing to to do how do you deal with that uh you know just like the philosophy which i followed what i can do that's what they always in my mind so if people do not understand i realize that here i am i have to uh, pay attention and uh, try to explain try to use words this is uh, easy to understand or some analog process and and help the people to understand because if they would know hey the this coronavirus is also a messenger rna a big messenger rna there are many many genes in it and those many others can kill you because can make you very sick but we are selecting just a little piece from that which helps your immune system educate how to recognize the virus when it comes you know so that people get the uh, vaccines which uh, live attenuated which when they injected you know this replicated there and and nobody was worrying and all of a sudden because mrna i mean th those uh, vaccines also had mrna but uh, the people didn't know uh, this is a uh, attenuated virus and that's fine everybody's getting it and you know they just uh, um, were not educated enough because listen uh, i mean uh, the immunology i learned in in a university i learned a lot and then when i met the drew weisman it seemed like uh, oh 10 years everything changed you know we immunology is uh, we understand differently uh, how uh, like a uh, immune system work and i learned everything from drew and i educated him on rna messenger rna and i learned from him the modern immunology and and we have a responsibility as a scientist to help the public to understand and to help them to understand that the scientists are are just like them hard working people who try to do good things and um since you've sort of had all of the success and recognition in the us you've built a life there you literally your your husband literally built a home for you there so this this is really where it seems to me home home is for you now but you still describe throughout the book a really strong enduring bond to your native country hungary where for instance you sent your daughter every summer um for several weeks um so that she could have a this special bond to that country as well how do you feel about hungary today i wonder since it's so um you know controversial now it's constantly being named as as one of the sort of autocracies and so on has your has your own relationship to hungary changed because hungary changed a lot since you left um so do you feel that your relationship to it has changed as well yeah i have to say my daughter has two little kids and they were in hungary in the small town where i grew up in the summer <laughs> and they en enrolled in the kindergarten so they would learn hungarian and they learn about our culture so through my daughter i learned also that how the country changed you know because she was a uh, friend with the kids with her age and then i you know learn uh, which kind of music they listen what what is going on and i mean uh, considering the politics and other things i have to say honestly that 
I do not really have time to uh, investigate, look at the facts one way or another, you know, right now, a lot of things about education, how it should be educated. I, I don't have time to realize it. Okay, how did they educate today and how it should be? So I, I don't really have much opinion. You know, I, 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 I know that uh, uh, politically, you know, the country right now is, uh, you know, is criticized and. But um, I, I don't know that uh, where where the um, truth is. You're, you know, I I I don't have time to uh, study completely that. What is the one side argument? What is the other argument? And what are the facts? Because you know everybody is emotional and everybody is upset and and uh, okay. I don't know this field. Let's just focus on my science and try to do something on that field you know that's how I feel myself but you know I I am presently in a professor at uh, my alma mater and um, and uh, I try to have different programs there uh, you know with RNA and uh, right now actually in November we are organizing a big uh, messenger RNA therapy meeting Drew Weissman will come and Ugur Zahin will come and talk and many others from Europe. So I try to uh, help, you know, with the education. So that that is an enduring relationship, clearly independent of, <laughs> of politics yeah. or whatever else is going oh, on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, sadly, that's all we have time for. And we didn't even get much into your actual work. I apologize for that. But at least I avoided looking very stupid by asking silly questions about complicated science. My my history brain doesn't really um, understand. Um, so, listeners, you should really get Catalin Carico's book, Breaking Through, My Life in Science. There are so many amazing stories and observations in it that we didn't even get to um, in this short episode. But it's really a brilliant read and I highly recommend it. So thank you so much, Kati, for taking the time to speak to me and for sharing some of your uh, really fascinating life story with my listeners. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, you might mention that is also available in German and also in audio book in German, that book. Yeah, absolutely. Loved. I loved the audio. I was listening to the um, English audio, which is read by somebody with a, with a light Hungarian accent, which I really enjoyed. It gave it that authentic sort of sound to go with it as well. It was brilliant. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.